السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله والصحبه أجمعين وبعد When you talk about the disasters, the earthquakes, the tsunamis and we've seen a lot of these in the last couple of years whether what happened with the tsunami that affected so many countries whether what happened in China, in Burma, all of these great disasters that happened. Also, other hardships and trials and tests, as we see what happened in different terrorist acts throughout the world, what happened recently in Gaza, what happened in the jails, Abu Ghraib, where people were tortured, what happened here in Mumbai not too long ago, what happened on 9-11 and on 7-7 and in Madrid, all of these are disasters. They're disasters of different types. But the question that needs to be asked, is there any positive side to these disasters? Can we benefit as Muslims from these disasters or not? This is what, inshallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, we want to talk about in today's lecture. Because as you know, these things have happened. But can we benefit from these things or not? What is the answer? Is there any good? Because what's apparent, something that's a disaster, there's no good in it. Who can answer me? Is there any good in these things? There's no good. Oh, there is. Nobody wants to answer? Hey, brother. Huh? It depends. Huh? Ibra. Ahsan. So he's saying there's ibra. We can reflect on it. That's why the lecture is entitled Reflecting. How can we benefit from such disasters? So there is benefit in it. And if you look at the hadith of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلُّهُ خَيْرٌ That it's strange the affair of the believer, because all of his affair, it is good. وَلَيْسَ هَذَا إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And that is only for the believer. Because the believer, as it came in the hadith, if he is given something that is good, or something good happens to him, شَكَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ that he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so it was actually good for him. And if he is ubtuli, afflicted with something, sabr, then he was patient, so it, uh, lahu, so it was good for him as well. And this hadith, I'll tell you two quick stories that happened to me. This hadith actually saved me from being embarrassed several times. And I mentioned this recently to the brothers in Canada when I was there, is that one time, when I left Saudi Arabia, I went back to live in Sudan. And Sudan, it's very hot. And the situation during that Ramadan, it was the first time I fasted Ramadan there in over 13 years. And it was very hot. And the electricity kept cutting off. And the water would cut off. So as I laid on my bed, and I didn't even have air condition at that time, I thought of this hadith, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ So subhanAllah, I thought, what, is there any benefits in this? What are the benefits in sitting here in this hot room, sweating, with no running water, the electricity cut off? Alhamdulillah, I was able to gather 20 or 30 different benefits that we can benefit from that situation. I was asked to give a talk on the spot during the end of Ramadan when I prayed with one of the Mashaykh and his masjid for Jumu'ah. And I didn't know what I was going to say. So then I thought about this and I made this my talk. Also a second time at this year, the beginning of Ramadan, the AC was not working in our masjid. So we stood there and we're coming for Taraweeh. And as you know, in Taraweeh, we want to focus on benefiting from the Salat, from uh, listening to the Quran. But it was so hot inside the masjid that we were sweating and sweating and sweating. It was very difficult. But also there was great benefit in this because this reminded us of the Qiyamah. When we will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. So I based my talk also then, when uh, our Shaykh asked me to give the talk between the, after the four rakats, that we remind ourselves, even in these difficult situations, about the day when we'll be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be held accountable for our sins. So the answer is, we can benefit from these disasters. And before I start to talk, or listen to the points and how we can benefit, I want to mention two principles. Qa'idatain, two principles. And the first one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the Hakim. He is the all-wise subhanahu wa ta'ala. From his names is the Hakim. And the Hikmah is putting something in its proper place. The definition of Al-Hikmah, of wisdom, is putting the things in their proper place. 
So anything that happens in this world, whether it seems to be a disaster or something that's evil, we must realize and remind ourselves that it has only happened through hikmah. Even if we are not able to realize what the hikmah, what the wisdom is, we must realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never done anything and never allowed anything to happen except for hikmah. And the second principle is that Allah knows and we do not. Perhaps something we might see it to be evil and it's actually very good for us. As it came in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَعَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ That perhaps you will dislike something and it's actually good for you and perhaps that you will like something وَعَسَى أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ That perhaps you will love something and want something but it will be worse or will be bad for you. And also if you look at the story in Surah An-Nur when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the story of Al-If when the munafiqeen, the hypocrites they accused our mother Aisha radiallahu anha of something that she was free of. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that clear that she was free of this later. But in the beginning, nothing was said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the munafiqeen started to spread rumors about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَحْسَبُوهُ أَشَّرٌ لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ do not think that it is evil for you. Don't think that it's something evil. In fact, or however, it is actually something that is good for you. So I want you to imagine this because this did not just affect the Prophet wasallam. It affected all of the Muslims. The whole entire Muslim community in Medina was affected by these rumors that were being spread. It was a very difficult time for the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says during this, do not think that it's something evil for you. In fact, it is something that is good for you. SubhanAllah. And from this, the munafiqeen, they were exposed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the munafiqeen. And also, it helps us benefit as it will come. Because when they're exposed, we know our true enemies. Because the munafiqeen, they're actually more dangerous on the Muslims than a lot of the non-Muslims themselves. Also, it showed the status and the level of Aisha radiallahu anha and in Islam. And the Sahaba used to come to her. And the tabi'een after them, they would come to her and ask her for fatwa. In fact, she is one of the biggest scholars of Islam, one of the biggest scholars of hadith, one of the biggest scholars of fiqh and tafsir, radiallahu anha, and she's a woman. So this also, this story showed the greatness of this woman and it raised in her status, radiallahu anha. If we look at it as an example of a lot of the scholars of Islam that were put in prison. If I were to ask anybody now, would you like to go to jail? spend some time in jail. Obviously, none of us would. Nobody wants to lose his freedom. But a lot of them, when they went to jail, they benefited a lot. They benefited themselves, and also they benefited the Muslim Ummah. If you look at the big book, al Mabsut and the Hanafi Fiqh, it was written by the author as he was imprisoned in a well. His students would come to him and they would write the book for him. So this book was written as he was imprisoned in a well. Also, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. Some of his books were written as he was in prison. And the scholars of Islam who have been imprisoned, they mention the benefits they find during the prison. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, he said, مَا حَفَظْتُ Quran illa fi usr." That I did not memorize the Qur'an except for in a time of difficulty. لِأَنَّنِي مَا سَأَلْتُ اللَّهِ أَنْ أَحْفَظَهُ فِي الْيُسْرِ He said, because I did not ask Allah to memorize the Qur'an in ease. So he said, مَا حَفَظْتُ Quran illa fi السِّجِنِ that I did not memorize the Qur'an except for when he was in prison. طيب, it's important that we point out that Imam Ahmed, as you all know, or anybody who has read his seerah, that he memorized the Qur'an when he was seven years old. And then he started to busy himself with the knowledge of hadith and memorizing the hadith and the asanid, the narrations of the hadith and the narrators and all of this. So he felt that his memorization of the Qur'an had become weak. It was not at the level that it should be. And he never was able to get the Qur'an down again except for when he was in jail. So jail, it seems like a bad thing to everybody, but actually there could be a lot of khair, a lot of good in it, as we saw what happened to our scholars. One of the things we gain, or the first point we can say that we actually gain from these disasters and the hardships that we face in life, is that it caused the Muslims to repent and to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, 
ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر that the evil has become apparent in the earth and at sea why بما كسبت ايدي الناس and that which the people have earned with their own hands this evil it could be the evil of corruption as we've seen a lot of muslim societies and a lot of non-muslim societies as well where the government system is a system of corruption this type of evil also the other disasters that happen earthquakes floods tsunamis this is also a form of evil but why does this happen and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he makes it clear in this verse first of all bima kasabat aydin nas this is what the people have earned with their own hands and then he says subhanahu wa ta'ala yudhiquhum ba'dal ladhi amilu la'allahum yarji'un for him to let them taste some of what that they have done meaning by their, their deeds with their own hands perhaps that they will return that they will return to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when we see these disasters we see these hardships and calamities it is actually a reminder of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a call for us to repent to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to return to him and to implement our islam in our lives also it is one of the ways that allah makes us humble and obedient to him subhanahu wa ta'ala allah says in the quran falawla idh ja'ahum ba'suna if or when our torment comes to them or when it reaches them what do they do tadarru that they become humble walakin qasat qulubuhum wa zayyana lahum ash-shaytan ma kanu ya'malun that but however their hearts have become hardened and a shaytan purifies for them that which they are doing so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he shows us through his signs through these things is that when these in these hardships that we become humble and we realize our need for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it will come shortly inshallah ta'ala as well also one of the great things of these calamities and these disasters and trials that we face in everyday life it is a test from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do you think that you will enter the jannah that you will enter the paradise without such trials as those who were before you مَسَّتْهُمْ الْبَأْسَاءَ وَالضَّرَّاءَ وَالزُلْزِلُ That they were touched by being poor and hardships and also by being shaken like in earthquakes and what have you. So these people were tested, the ones who were before us were tested and we are here to be tested as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that they will be left alone to say they believe and they will not be tested. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So, and we have tested those who are before you and so Allah will know those who are truthful and He will know the liars. So we see in this verse also that we are here to be tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us and test our iman. And if you look at the difference between the Muslim and the non-Muslim, when you watch non-Muslims, or even sometimes on their TV shows, or on movies, if something bad happens, what do they say? Why me? Why me? Some of them, they look up to the sky, and they start to say, Why are you doing this to me? What have I done to deserve this? SubhanAllah. The difference, because we have the Iman with Qadr. They say they believe in the destiny, but in the implementation, we see that their belief is not like ours. Because no way a Muslim who believes in Allah in the last day could look up to the sky and say, Ya Allah, why are you doing this to me? He knows, even though it's something difficult, it's hardship. He knows that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is being tested with. And he knows he must be patient through this. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has informed us that this dunya is the sijin of the mu'min. It's the prison of the believer. And it is the jannah of the kafir, of the non-Muslim. And we gain through this, that we are actually in a sijin. Because our goal as Muslims is what? To reach the hereafter and to be successful in the hereafter. And this sijin, this prison that we're in, is the prison life easy? Life in prison, is it easy? Maybe none of you have ever been, but it's not. Even if you have seen it on TV, life in prison is very, very difficult. And so is the life we live in everyday life. It's very difficult and it's a prison. As our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to us. Also from the things that we gain from these difficulties is we realize that the human being is weak. We are weak as humans. Ya ayyuhal nas, antumul fuqara ilallah, wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid. 
O mankind, verily you are the ones who are weak and are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, He's the ghani, the rich, the one who is free of all needs, uh, the hamid, the one worthy of praise. So we remind ourselves during the time of hardships, when a tragedy happens, when a disaster happens, we are reminded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that how much we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see this a lot of times when we get sick, one of us becomes very ill. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we know, even if we have a good doctor, there's no cure except for in the hands of who? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah decides that the medicine we're taking will not cure us, then it will not be a cure. So these difficulties and these hardships and disasters, it reminds us as well of our need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we are weak. And it makes our hearts become attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for us to be successful in this dunya, we must always have our hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will never happen. Or this is one of the things that helps us attaching our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also from the things that we gain from these difficulties, especially when we go through them, is that it's a way to have our sins forgiven. It's a way for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Now, as I was coming here, I wasn't feeling good. So I looked at any of my first lecture in India, and I'm not going to be able to perform the way I want to perform because I don't feel well. But I remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the person who is sick, his sins fall away or shed away like the leaves of a tree. As they fall off a tree in the fall, also this is how the sins, also how they fall off, and you are cleansed from your sins when you are ill. So it's actually a call to us to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have our sins. It's an opportunity. It's actually a fursa to have our sins forgiven. Also in the hadith, another hadith, the Prophet says, ما يزال البلاء بالمؤمن والمؤمنة في نفسه ووردي وماله That the affliction, there will still be affliction, a permanent affliction perhaps, in with the believing man or the believing woman until with himself or his child or in his, with his money. He will be afflicted until he meets Allah. حتى يلقى الله وليس عليه خطيئة So we can see some people are afflicted by a permanent disease, by a permanent sickness. Some people might be handicapped or crippled. And this is a bala a lot of us have been afflicted with. And this will raise in our status and will forgive us from our sins until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are free from all of the sins and all of the bad deeds that we have done throughout our lives. Also, as we mentioned, one of the benefits we gain through the hardships in life and the difficulties that we face as an ummah is exposing the munafiqeen. And as I mentioned before, the munafiqeen are the most dangerous, the hypocrites, the most dangerous people on the Muslim ummah. And we see now a lot in Palestine when our Muslim brothers are killed and the bombs fall on the women and the children. It's usually one of the hypocrites who help them and killing our Muslim brothers, uh, Wallahu musta'an. So the hypocrites, they're dangerous on the Muslim society. But these things, when something happens, a difficulty, these people are exposed. For example, in the beginning of Islam, in Medina, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions, when they wanted to go out for Ghazwat Uhud, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they were not well known during that time. Because it was at the beginning of the Hijrah, the first few years of the Hijrah. So, when the army left to go out to meet the army of the mushrikeen, a big part of the army decided to what to return and go back. Because they were hypocrites and they didn't want to fight, they didn't want to die for la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah because they don't believe in it. So this exposed them to the Muslims. Also in the day we live in, we have the hypocrites, the munafiqs, who attack Islam and they claim that they're Muslims. He might be from a Muslim family and he might have a Muslim name, but it's very clear he's from the hypocrites from what he says and how he acts and how he attacks Islam in the name of Islam. Subhanallah, when I was in Canada recently, one of these munafiqeen, he took his group, a so-called Muslim group, to the government in Canada and asked them to ban the niqab. Now pay attention. The guy has a Muslim name from a Muslim family. He claims to have a Muslim group. The kufar, the non-Muslim, didn't ask to have the niqab banned. This is a, a person who claims to be Muslim. He's asking them to ban the niqab. Wallahu musta'an. So also you see during the times of hardship, 
when Islam is at a weak state. You'll see that the munafiqi, the hypocrites, they will talk about Islam and slander Islam in indirect and direct ways. Also from the things we gain during the times of hardships and disasters is it brings out the brotherhood in Islam. And as you know, for the importance of brotherhood in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned from the seven who will be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, when there's no shade except for his, is those who came together for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and brotherhood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً that verily the believers are brothers. And this brotherhood in Islam is stronger than the brotherhood of your own brother to you. In your own family, your own brother and your own sister, this brotherhood is actually stronger. So these difficulties, it brings us together as an ummah. If a disaster happens, if there's flooding, we'll see that the Muslims, they strive to go and help their Muslim brothers and sisters. They bring them clothes, they bring them medicine. All of this in order to what? help their Muslim brothers and sisters. Also, if you recall a few years ago, and all of you recall this, when Denmark, when the papers there started to have the cartoons about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and slander him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam through these cartoons, we see how this affected the Muslims, how the Muslims came together. Even the people who are very weak in their practice, they came together and they want to stand and defend our Prophet So actually, these type of things, they are a wake-up call for the Muslims and it brings the Muslims together. So we benefit a lot from this. Even I remember one time in Australia where the skin hits, they started to hit Muslims, even some Muslims that had been stabbed, and this brought the whole Muslim community together. And even the people who were not practicing, they came to defend Islam. And this in the government when they saw this, 15,000 in the masjid there, they put an end to the racial attacks that were coming from the skinheads on the Muslims. So now we can gain this, we can benefit from this brotherhood and renew in this brotherhood through these difficult times. Even I recall now in Sudan, two times in the last few years we have been attacked. Once was a riot when the vice president died, his people from the south, they rioted, they burnt down a lot of the stores, they broke into our houses. They even raped some of our Muslim women. And I was there, I saw this with my own eyes. From the good things that happened to this, and this is obviously doesn't seem like a good thing. And he has somebody went into his store with a few kids to protect the kids. They poured gasoline under the door and they burned him and the kids alive. This is a very tragic thing. However, what came from this is the brotherhood of the Muslims in the north, that they came together as one unit and as brothers in Islam. Also, when we were attacked by another group coming from Darfur, and the bombs are going off next to my house and the machine guns. Also, this brought the Muslim community together. It woke them up and it brought them together that we must be as one to make sure that we can protect our Islam and protect our country there and be with the rulers there. Also, one of the things that we gain from these tragic events is that it reminds us of the reality of death. All of us know that we're going to die. Nobody has any doubt that he is going to die. But when you see a hundred thousand people killed in an earthquake, what does this do? It's just very tragic. It reminds you of how much you need to strive and you need to implement your Islam before you die. Because that's it's death. And a lot of us think we're going to get old. We're going to be 60, 65, 75, 80. We're going to get sick, go to the hospital, and then die of natural causes. But look, just this quick, the earthquakes, nobody knows it's coming. And just like that, you have 100,000 who are dead. Some buried alive and then die, and some die instantly. So the death comes and it reminds us of the reality of death. And this reminds us, or it encourages us to strive, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us in the Quran when He says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqati. When Allah says to us, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah as He ought to be feared. وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ and do not die except for in the state of Islam. The state of Islam that you have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing that which He has ordered you to do and stay away from that which He has forbid you from. And also, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ To say that my prayer and my rites of sacrifice and my life and in my death are for Allah, the Rabb of Al-Alameen, 
he has no partner will be thalika umirt. And with this I have been ordered, wa ana awwal al-Muslimin, and I am the first of the Muslims. So this is how a true Muslim is. A true Muslim is not a Muslim on the tongue. A true Muslim is the Muslim through actions, through his acts. And it's not enough for us to claim to be Muslims and then not implement Islam. And perhaps you heard in the past lecture, I think I heard some of the stuff as I was coming in, Sheikh Ammar was talking about this issue. And a lot of us, we say we claim to be Muslim. And a lot of the negative aspects that people look at Islam now is because of us, because of the Muslims. And the funny thing is, as they know a lot of stuff is haram for us. And when they say it's doing it, it's a big problem. They can do it. You know, because their belief, they say Jesus died for our sins. The Christians, they'll tell you that Jesus died for their sins. So, if one of a good Christian dies, they say he's in a better place. If somebody from the mafia or a gang member or a criminal, when he gets shot and he gets killed, they say now he's in a better place. Because they don't have the deeds. They believe that Jesus died for their sins, alayhi salam, so they can do as they please in this life. But we, as Muslims, we believe that we will be held accountable on the day of judgment for our sins. And those who obey the law and follow His command, that they will be entering the Jannah. And those who disobey Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they will be in the hellfire. And it's important that we point out, if we're going to be successful and die in the state of Islam, the only way we can do this is to follow the path and the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِن رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَعْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never sent any messenger except for that he is to be obeyed by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we must ask ourselves now, do we obey our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do we implement his sunnah in our life alayhi salatu wa sallam? If we were to go to a doctor now and find that we have some illness, some disease, and he were to give us the cure, he said, Alhamdulillah, we found the illness in the beginning stages. All you have to do now is take medicine and you will be cured. And you tell him, okay, take it, I will do it. Good, I'll do it. And then uh, you go home, you don't take the medicine. Will you benefit from what he told you? You're not going to benefit. Also, when we claim to be Muslims, we claim to be following the Prophet ﷺ, we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, and we don't follow him, we will not benefit from what we're saying. Also now, to go to a job, and our boss were to tell us what we need to do to be successful in the workplace, how to do our job properly, and then we go every morning, we just sit there and do nothing. Will we be successful in our workplace? Also, we will not be successful. So when we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, we claim to love Allah, how do we know this is true in our actions? Some of us now, the first thing we do when we get up in the morning, do we get up and pray Fajr on time? Or do we pray it after the, the sun so we can get a little extra sleep? And then a lot of us, when we get up, the first thing we do is stand in front of the mirror and we shave our beards so we can look like so-and-so and not like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this shows us the actions in your life and how you act if you really love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you cannot die in the state of Islam unless you're on the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كُلُّ أُمَّتِي يَدْخُلُونَ لَلْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى That all of my ummah will enter the paradise except for those who refuse. I pay attention to this hadith. And the Sahaba said, وَمَنْ يَأْبَى يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ They were surprised. And this is the same thing I say to my students at the beginning of each year when they ask about the test. They say, oh, how's the test? How's the test going to be? I say, all of you will pass on my exam except for he who refuses to pass. And they say, who refuses to pass? Well, somebody refused to pass. Now the Prophet wasallam is telling the Sahaba that all of his ummah will enter paradise except for he who refuses. And they said, man ya ba ya Rasulullah, who will refuse? At something, it seems very like a very strange statement. He said, Man ata'ani dakhal al jannah, wa man asani faqad aba. That whoever obeys me, he will enter the jannah, and whoever disobeys me, then he is from the one who has refused. So now we must ask ourselves are we from those who obey the Prophet? Are we from those who follow his sunnah? And if you are, inshallah, bi'idnillah, you will be going to the jannah. And if you are not, 
then you are from the people who have refused the Jannah. May Allah protect us all from that. Also, pay attention to this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَ وَسَعَلَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ That whoever has desire for the hereafter. And all of us claim that we have a desire to be in Al-Jannah and to be far away from the hellfire. But what's important as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَعَلَهَا سَعْيَهَا That you strive for it with the necessary effort. So it's not enough to just be mu'min, to be a believer. If you're not striving and putting forth the effort, then you will not benefit from this desire you claim you have. فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And those will be the ones who their striving will be appreciated or be accepted and will get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talk about death, ayyuhal ikhwa, and the reality of death is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, what he used to say. He used to say, إِذَا مَا ذَكَرْتِ الْمَوْتِ سَعَى مَا تَقَلْبِي If I do not remember death any every hour, then my heart will die. How many times have we remembered death and thought about death and thought about preparing for death? How many of us has written his wasiya? Ask yourself now. Can I get a raise of hands if somebody has written his will? Be honest, don't be ashamed. Who has written their will? They're ready to die. Nobody in the audience. You wrote yours, alhamdulillah. I want to write mine. I keep saying I'm going to do it, but I haven't done it. I said, I haven't done it yet. And this is from the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he told us that we should not put our heads down at night until we have written our wasiyah. We are prepared for death. But unfortunately, most of us, we're not ready. Because we think we're going to be here forever, or we hope anyways. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to encourage or the beginning of Islam, he forbid the Muslims from visiting graves. Why? Because he was afraid what could happen from shirk. Because these are people who used to be mushrikeen. They used to be polytheists and they used to worship idols. So he knew what happened to the people of Nuh and the ones who came after him who, when they committed shirk. So he was afraid that this could happen to his ummah. So he forbid them in the beginning of Islam to visiting graves. But then after that, he saw that there was a greater benefit in visiting the graves. So he said, كُنْتَ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُوهَا فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرْ بِالْآخِرَةِ He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. He said, so visit the graves because verily it reminds you of the hereafter. When he visited the graves, as it was done in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So he said, كُنْتَ نَهَيْتُكُمْ when you look into the grave, it reminds you that one day you will be in a bunch of white sheets and they will be lowering you into your grave. And this reminds you to prepare and to get ready for that great day. Also, from the things that we benefit from these disasters and hardships that we face in everyday life is a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are here in this dunya to do as many good deeds as possible to get prepared for the hereafter. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib aw abiru sabil. To be in this dunya as if you are somebody, as a stranger or somebody who is just passing through. And if you look at how you live when you, go, when you travel to another country, you, how much do you take of your clothes? When you travel, do you take your refrigerator and your clothes and your washing machine, you put it on the car, you take all the things, you pull your house behind you? No, you just take a few things. And this is how the Muslims should be in the dunya. It doesn't mean you can't have things from the dunya, but you should focus on that what you need. And that will, will help you get to the akhirah. And that's important that we point out that the zuhud, when we talk about zuhud in the dunya, as it was mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah, that the proper zuhud is that which leaving does not help us in reaching the akhirah. Anything from the dunya that will help us in reaching the akhirah, leaving it is not from zuhud. But we should focus on doing as many good deeds as we can. Just as somebody who's passing through, he's doing a job in a certain city, and then he's leaving. And this is how the Muslims should be in this dunya. Uh, we know that eventually we're going to die and move on to the hereafter, so we want to prepare for that day. And that's why Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah he would narrate this hadith 
وإذا أمسيت فلا تنتظر الصباح وإذا أصبحت فلا تنتظر المساء If you were to wake up in the morning, do not wait for the evening. If you were to reach the evening, then do not wait for the morning. Because you never know when your time will be coming. A very touching story that happened a few months back to one of our mashaykh in Saudi Arabia. And this reminds you about writing the wasiyah, about writing your will before you die. One of the mashaykh, he was traveling. His name is Sheikh Abdulaziz Al-Wahibi, rahimahullah. He was traveling from Riyadh to the Eastern Province to give a lecture. And before he left, his wife, his first wife, and his daughters, he had eight daughters, mashallah, they said, we want to go with you as like a vacation. After you do your lecture, then we'll and it will hang out there for some time, and this will be our vacation for the summer. So the sheikh said, okay. Then he got in his car and he started to drive. He's driving down the highway. For some reason, his daughter who was a very pious Muslim, and one of the sisters who had memorized the Qur'an, and had memorized the Qira'at, different recitations, and she was working in, in spreading Islam, and spreading the Qur'an, and helping other Muslim women memorize the Qur'an, she started to write her wasiyah as she was in the car. As they were going, somebody and a truck in front of him, it seems he didn't have his lights working, so the sheikh, he collided into the back of this big truck, he immediately died. His first wife died. The second wife was at home. She didn't go with him. And four of his daughters, I believe, out of the eight, also died. And he, most of them instantly, and some died in the hospital. So this a family is going out. Alhamdulillah, they're going for khair. They're going for da'wah. And they're going on vacation to change the everyday life. So they're going out for something that's good and praiseworthy. And they're going to have fun. And just like that, uh, six of them or five of them immediately died. So you never know when the death is going to come. And that's why Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he would say, do not wait for the evening if you wake up in the morning. And do not wait for the morning if you reach the evening because you never know when you're going to go. And it was said by some of the tabi'een, about 30 of them, uh, rahimahullah, that if they were be to be told tomorrow that it was the qiyamah or that they would be dying, they could not do any more actions because they were working so hard and doing ibadah and worship and doing good for Islam. And this is how a Muslim must be at all times, trying to do as many good deeds as he can. And to remind ourselves that how you die, this is how you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if somebody is doing something that which is haram, some people now, he goes into his bedroom and he watches that which is haram and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the door moves, oh, he, he's scared. Somebody's going to see what he's looking at. But he forgets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. His weakness and his iman. And just to think, if you were to die on that, if you were to be found, you're watching something that was haram. Somebody is to be found dead, he has committed zina. Recently in Sudan, there were two, they were on the wrong path. And this man, he picked up this young lady, and they decided to go to his garage and do what they were going to do. So when he pulled into the garage, and he was a very ignorant person, he didn't realize that they could die from the fumes and the carbon monoxide inside the garage with the windows and the AC on in the car. So they were found the next morning naked in his car. May Allah protect us from that. So now these people, this is how they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. If somebody drinks khamar, and becomes drunk, he will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is drunk. May Allah protect us from this. So we always must remind ourselves of the reality of death, and that this dunya is for us to prepare for the hereafter. These disasters and difficulties we see in everyday life, this is a great reminder to us for these things. And also in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he said that if the children of Adam, if they die, they will take three things with them to their grave. أَهْلَهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ His family will follow him to the grave. Also his money, it's still his until he's buried in his grave. And his deeds. فَيَرْجِعْ إِثْنَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَاحِدْ Two will return. The family and the money, they will return. And the only thing you will have with you is on that day in your grave is your deeds. And we will end, inshallah ta'ala, this lecture 
with this verse. And many verses in the Quran, the people who died, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send them back to the dunya so they could do good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, وَيَوْمَ يَعُدُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ The day that the person who is a zalim, he has oppressed himself by doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will be biting on his hands out of the fear of that great day. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ رَسُولِ سَبِيلًا He will say, I wish I had taken a path with the Prophet. He will wish that he had followed the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba and the pious of the scholars of Islam and those who implemented Islam who came after them. He wished he had followed this path. يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا He will say, and he woe to me, I wish I didn't take so-and-so as a friend. Why? What did this person do to you? He will say, لَقَدْ أَضَّلَّنِي عَلَى الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِجَّاءَنِي That he distracted me or took me away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after it came to me. وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خُذُولًا That a shaytan is for humans a deserter. He will call us to that which seems to be beautiful and seems to be nice, but then he will desert us at the end. May Allah protect us from all this. So this is a reminder. And one of the things we remind, as the brother said in the beginning when I asked, he said it's ibra, that it's something that we can reflect on. It's a reminder to all of us. When we see these great tragedies, that it reminds us that we must be in the best state. We must be of those, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَا تَمُتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمِ Do not die except for in the state of istislam, of being a Muslim who has submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, we see from the difficulties that have happened to the Muslim ummah today. Because all of us are labeled as terrorists. We're guilty until I'm proven innocent. And the Western laws are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But as a Muslim, you are guilty until proven innocent, unfortunately. So now also this is a big test for the Muslims today to see what they're going to do with this, their Islam. Allah is testing us. A lot of people now, uh, we've seen people have brought their children back to the Eastern countries and they know nothing about Islam. They, know nothing, they don't know how to read Al-Fatiha because they're scared and embarrassed to be Muslims. They don't want people to know. They're undercover Muslims, only at home. When it comes time to pray at his job place, he doesn't pray. So this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Muslims, we do not agree with extremism. But at the same time, we do not agree with having a watered-down version of Islam where we do that which is haram and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please the non-Muslims. And I say again that the message we take and we benefit from this lecture is that we must reflect and benefit on disasters or anything. It might seem evil in our lives. There could be a lot of good in it. We just have to reflect and see what that good is and uh, benefit from it. And we should be always in a state, the best state. So we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that he will be pleased with us. And at the end, Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad. Jazakallah khaira, Brother Abdurrahim Makathi, for an excellent set of lessons and reminders. Now we will have the question and answer session, insha'Allah. And just a reminder, the question and answer session is open both to Muslims and non-Muslims. And we do give preference to non-Muslims. If you do wish to ask a question, just ask one of the volunteers and they will put you to the front of the queue, insha'Allah. Just a quick reminder as well, some of the etiquettes of the question and answer session. Do make sure that your questions are on the topic at hand. Please keep the questions short and concise and ask one question at a time. Make sure to speak loudly and clearly as it can be a little bit difficult to hear some of the questions up here. And as well, state your name and profession before the questions. So we'll commence now with the question and answer session. And we'll have the first question coming from the front mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Talat Ansari, I'm from Nagpur. My question on topic related to disaster is related to Christianity concept of born sin or original sin. And the scenario is the flood of Nuha described in Bible as well as in Quran. And Quran says, if you are not learned, ask the learned. I am taking you as learned of not only Quran but also Bible. I am asking this question in the light of Bible that when 
the flood of Noah as described in Bible, which saved all good peoples, meaning that all sinners were drowned. No sinner were alive. So, still, if Christians believe that son of Adam is sinner, is it correct? Or son of Adam, like us, like other Christians, their sin has already been cleared during the flood of Noah. This question is from brother also and all Christians also. Just a quick reminder, please keep the questions on the topic at hand. The topic at hand is reflection upon the world's disasters. I'll leave it to the speaker to, if he wants to address this or not, but they must be on topic, otherwise we'll go to the next question. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We'll go over quickly. And it, what I know as a former Christian, and the Christians believe that when Jesus was placed on the cross and crucified as they believe, that this was for the forgiveness of their sins. And I don't know about the flood of Nuh, but the, what is known is that the Christians believe that uh, Christ being crucified in their belief, that this was for the, for the forgiveness of their sins. But if we look at this rationally, logically, why did God create heaven and hellfire? If everybody's going to go to heaven as long as they believe in the person who does good deeds and bad deeds, all of them are going to heaven, then why is there hellfire? Also, Christians claim to believe in the, in the day of judgment. So if nobody's going to be judged, he takes a direct flight right to, to Jannah, to paradise. What is the benefit? So anyways, in Islam, teaches us that we are all held accountable for our deeds. And they will all stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and be judged for our deeds. And we have a scale, which on one side will have the, the good deeds and on the other side, the bad deeds. And whichever one is heavier will be the place where we will go. If some Muslims enter the hellfire, then perhaps they will leave. They have not committed shirk. They will leave, inshallah, the hellfire at a later time after they are, are punished for what they have done in this dunya. And when we have this type of aqidah, this type of belief, this causes us to strive to what? To implement Islam. And now, that's why you don't find the Muslims who fornicate as much as non-Muslims. Because they realize what could happen to them in the hereafter for, for committing this great t crime. You don't find a lot of Muslims, and you find, might find a few, but it's, they're, they're not practicing Islam. But in general, you don't find Muslims who will get, who will get drunk because they know of the, the evil effects of this in this dunya and the evil effects they can have. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Man shariba minha fi dunya lam yashraba fil akhirah. Whoever drinks from it in the dunya, he will not drink from it in the hereafter. So, all of this, it shows us, and this is the logical thing that we are held accountable. We're not just sitting here to do what we want to do in this dunya and then have a free ride at the end. We're going to be held accountable. Just as if we were to have a job, we will be held accountable for our performance in our job. Also, we'll be held accountable for our deeds in this dunya. And Allahu A'lam. Thank you. The next question from the Riyamai. Assalamu alaikum. Myself, Liyakat Shah. I am a teacher by profession and I came all together from Busawal. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Zakir Naik and all the Islamic scholars who had arrived here and it shows or displays a wonderful extravagance bonanza of Islamism. Really, I would like to salute all those dignitaries who had come here. Well, my question is that I would like to ask to the dignitaries that did Prophet Muhammad wasallam has undertaken any journey by water? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No, I never knew in the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ took a journey by water. Uh, even most of the Sahaba were not known to have uh, taken journeys on water. Uh, it came later with the Muslims when they started to conquer new lands. They traveled on boats and they made a Muslim navy, if you want to say, to defend the Muslim men and to conquer other lands at that time. I don't know anything from the Sunnah where the Prophet ﷺ actually took a journey uh, by water. So it is not clear whether Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has undertaken journey yeah. by water. This is, what, this is what I know that he has. Okay, thank you, sir. The next question from the front mic. Uh, my name is Muhammad Nizamuddin. I am an SAP professional. And my question is like, as per Quran and Sunnah, what is the legal verdict regarding tobacco consumption? Is it haram or makruh? And uh, like in Surah Al-Baqarah, I have, I have uh, 
seen the translation as like, uh, if you take anything which is uh, toxic to you, it is haram to you. Please, just a reminder everybody, I'm serious when I say it. the questions must be on topic. You can easily visit the Fatwa website for this. Again, I'll leave it to the speaker if he wishes to address this, but keep the questions on the topic. First of all, before I say if it's makruh or haram, I want to explain why at, at one time there was a difference of opinion. Why some scholars used to say it was makruh and some would say it was haram. That's because when cigarettes, back when they first came to the Muslim nations, there's no ayah hadith that says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, don't smoke, don't chew tobacco. So the scholars looked at similarities. They found that whoever smokes, he smells bad. He has smoker's breath. And they looked at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he forbid them from going to the masjid if they have eaten the basl, onions, or garlic. Thum. And they said just as these people, have, they stink or they have bad breath, also the smoker is the same. So they said, and then it's makru. However, other scholars at the beginning, they looked at it and they said it's haram from the beginning. Later, all of the scholars, I don't really know anybody now who says it's makru. And he's somebody who is a real scholar and understands Islam properly, who would say that it's makru. A lot of the general people of the Muslim ummah, they know the old fatwa of makru and they still want to hold on to it, so they can say they're not doing that which is haram. But after the scholars learn, for example in Egypt and Al-Azhar and these places, when they learn that uh, smoking causes cancer, it kills you, uh, it's a waste of money, uh, all the evil effects that smoking has. Now all of the ma major uh, places of fatwa throughout the, the Islamic world, they say it's haram. Because of the, the evil effects that it has, it wastes your money, it, uh, it harms your health, and it could eventually kill you. And it, killing yourself is one of the great sins in Islam and it's not allowed. And Allahu alam. The next question from the Ramai. With due respect to you, sir. Okay. With so much faith in Islam and people believing, or uh, forget about those who don't believe or don't read. You talk about so much negativity. You remember death. Before dying, people die hundreds and millions of times. Why is Islam portraying so much negativity? And what about the conflict? Those people who are on the right path. Suppose if some people misguide them, what is the direction to today's youngsters? There is so much. You talk about disasters. Disasters were also from ages. Today, some, something is not new. Uh, bomb attacks are not new. Volcanoes are not new. Earthquakes are not new. If something is to be destructible, why should we remember death every moment? Why cannot we re remember life? If I have a brother on my left and my right, why can't I? In, uh, there's a split. There's a split moving. Why can't I uh, uh, infuse life in them? Why do I make them scared or feared? Death, death, death. Inshallah, everybody has to die. You, me, every, all the kings, all the princes. Who, yeah, perfect. My, it's, my it's, question, clear, it's, it's clear my, what you want to say. I, I got sir, you. Sir, uh, you didn't get me. Just the last. Why are not people positive about life, inducing life? Why death? Uh, when we talk about death, the importance of remembering death, as I mentioned, it so we can be prepared and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best states. Because if you're not prepared, that means you're not going to try to ha have as many good deeds as you can. It means that you can meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're doing something that's displeasing to Him. That's what I'm talking about death. But also, when we're living our life in this dunya, we also have to make life to the fullest. We have to try to find the halawa of iman, the beauty of life and, and, and our search for happiness. That we, found this, we find the sweetness of iman and this is what helps us get through this, this life. And we must make our life to the fullest. We don't, um, I'm not saying now we will say, let's talk about death, that we go home, we sit back and just think about death and we have only fear. No, we also have hope and we also enjoy life. We, we try to build in this dunya and be as productive as we can to, to our societies. So we have, we have to have a full life at the same time. We have to realize what I'm trying to say is that some, uh, or any, and this is what I'm talking about disasters, when you see such a large amount of death at one time, this reminds you of the reality of death and that's where all of us are going. This doesn't mean that we're not going to live a full life. We're not going to strive to be uh, engineers or doctors or whatever it is we do in life. No, we must strive. We must try to uh, build houses if we can build a house for our children and for this and do as much as we can and benefit from this dunya and to have a happy life. But also we cannot forget 
the reality of death that it's coming may be quicker than a lot of us know. So we must be prepared for what is coming and Allahu Alam. Thank you very much. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa My name is Fahana. I am a student. In your speech, you quote the verse of Surah Room. Zahar al Fasad Filbar. Could you please explain this verse again? Now, in this verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the evil has become an apparent or clear on land and at sea. And this evil, as I said, I believe I did explain it during the talk, was that it could be any type of evil. It could be corruption. In a lot of societies today, they have corruption. And it's corrupt societies. It could be this type of corruption. It could be other types of evil. Uh, it could be crime. It could be the evil we see from disasters and tragedies. Where does this come from? Bima kasabat nas. What the people have earned with their own hands, what they have done. And because when you, when you know, when you are committing sins, you're doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what causes these types of disasters. So after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that it's, it's so they can taste. So they, they can taste that what they have done. Because they have done that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is punishing them for what they have done to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and not following His way and following His law. And then it's a reminder for him that perhaps they will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they see this, these great tragedies and evil, they know that the only way out is to have their hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allahu alam. The next question from the front mic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa I am Muhammad Kursid Alam from Bihar, working in Mumbai in construction company as a civil engineer. My question is. Is suicide bombing is right way or Islamic way to fight with the enemies of Islam? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Also one of the hot topics that we usually find in a lot of talks and a lot of lectures is about suicide bombing. Um, is it a way to fight the kufar? I don't believe it is. And we have seen that so many times that the people who have done this, the corruption and the problems that they've caused for the Muslim communities around the world. So this is not a proper way to rebel. Uh, a lot of Muslims who, who, who follow this way, they do this because they feel it's like they have given up. So they find this is the only way out. Um, perhaps on the battlefield, it could be a different story. Is it permissible on the battlefield? That's something else. But in everyday life, like what happened on 9-11, or what happened in 7-7, where somebody goes and innocent people, and he kills innocent people by suicide bombing, this is not acceptable in Islam. This is not a proper way for us to uh, fight the enemies of Islam. On the battlefield, it could be another story because uh, that's something that goes back to the generals and the army and what, what they see on the battlefield. If it's something that's good for the Muslim army or not, that's a different story. But in everyday life, it's not permissible uh, to harm or to kill any innocent human being, whether they're a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Wallahu alam. The next question from the rear mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Mohammad Javed and I'm working in an MNC company as a technical support analyst. My question is that recently one of my neighbor died and it is a common disaster what we face on a daily basis. People die, but the family members were really shocked because he was just 42 years of age and he had five children. The youngest one was just eight years old. So what they were telling me when I said to be patient. They were telling me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have taken his hand or leg but would not taken his life. So he would have not done that. So I could not able to respond because they were so shocked and grieved. So how do we need to console in this kind of situation? Are they Muslim or not Muslim? They were Muslim. Okay. This thing you can see obviously there's a person who might be Muslim but they have weak Iman. Weak Iman in the Qadr uh, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He chooses anything through hikmah, through wisdom. Even if it might seem difficult, I know several people who have died and left behind bigger families than what you have mentioned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up doors for their families, and they're actually better off financially than they were before the father of the family died. And I'll tell you two stories about that. One of our mashaykh in Sudan, he was traveling from Port Sudan, going to Khartoum, and on his way, in his car, he had a little station wagon. With, uh, he had like 11 kids and three wives in the car. They got in a car accident, the car flipped over. 
there was a few scratches, and I think one of his wife broke her arm, and that was about it. The sheikh, he got a little scratch on his head only, but he was killed immediately, because he was hit on his head. Immediately after he died, the brothers bought a house and broke it down into three little houses for his family, and they had much more money than they did before that. So a lot of these people, they might be scared that, that now there's no income because the father had died. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will open up doors. And this is a test, a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you see one of your loved ones taken. And the highest level of the belief in the qadr is the rida. To be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has happened. And I'll tell you a story, you might see it being crazy. But what happened at one time in Saudi Arabia, when a man was traveling and they had two cars. Uh, he was traveling with his wife and his daughters in one. And as you know, in Saudi Arabia, most they have like 10, 12 kids each. And then his sons were all in front in the pickup truck. As they were coming, driving down the road, expressway or a highway, a tractor trailer, it slammed into his sons in front of him. And they were just, the car was just in pieces and everywhere. So obviously everybody in the car had died. What did this man do? Why, why? No, he got down and he made sujood shukr. SubhanAllah, he got out of the car and made sujood shukr. He thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he wanted to have rida. He knew his sons were dead. And he knew there was nothing he could do to change that. They were gone right in front of his eyes. There was nothing he could do. So he wanted to be pleased with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, during this difficult time. Another story about the issue of money. People being scared about money. One of our mashaykh, rahimahullah, he died and he left behind 37 children and three wives. Actually 41 because his brother-in-law had been uh, murdered and he it was taking care of his four kids too. So he had 41 children in his house and three wives, 37 which were his. When he was placed in his, in his grave in Kuwait, rahimahullah, he actually, the family received more money uh, and people were taking care of them more during that time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does everything through hikmah and everybody has to go. Another story I'll tell you. A person there in the, recently in, in Egypt, one of the, the mashaykh there told this story where somebody, he had just graduated, he was going to get married and they came to wake him up one morning and he he just become an engineer, uh, and he, he was just about to get he was getting married in a few days. Everything had been finished, the engagement, and they were getting ready for the wedding, and they found him dead. Salat al Fajr. He's 25 years old, not 42, 25. So when it's your time, you're gonna go, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we have to be pleased with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala chose, and this is what He chose, and we have to be patient. There's nothing we can do. We can't bring the man back, and there's nothing we can do. You can't cry over spilled milk, as they say. What's done is done. So you have to be pleased with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no doubt it's a test. And we're in this dunya to be tested. Allah tests us and uh, to see the level of iman and how we will deal with these type of tragedies. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah, brother. The next question from the front mic. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum. I'm Dr. Muhammad Salim. I'm basically doing traumatology and I see a lot of trauma happening, a lot of deaths. So become numb to people uh, who are in distress who have injuries, who die. So it's like your heart becomes hardened. So is there anything that can advise that my heart doesn't get so hardened and I can still practice without being too emotionally involved so that I don't make errors in my judgments and no? I think I mentioned this actually in the, in the lecture. And one of the things, this is actually, it's a blessing in disguise for you when you see this type of trauma because it reminds you of the reality of death and how quick and how tragic it could be. So you can be prepared. But at the same time, in your field, you have to have uh, tawazun. You have, you know, have to be in, on the middle. If you get too emotionally attached, you're not going to be able to do your job correctly, as you mentioned. So you have to focus on that. And then thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it's actually a ni'mah because you are reminded constantly of death. I remember, I saw one of the brothers used to be a soccer player uh, in Riyadh, professional soccer player in Saudi Arabia. And he started to really practice his Islam. And one of the things he does now is he washes the dead brothers uh, in Islam. When they die, they come to the masjid and he's the one who, who washes them all. So this is, he said, it's one of the best things he's ever done because it reminds him always of death and he's always prepared and always has his heart attached to the akhirah. So you can actually benefit greatly from this, but you have to make sure while you're benefiting, as you mentioned yourself, that you don't get too attached. Because if you get too attached and your emotions take you away from doing your job, then you're not going to do it correctly as you mentioned yourself and Allahu alam. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum. The question is, as Muslims, we can understand that the disasters are from Allah Ta'ala and they are a test for us. But how do we explain the same to non-Muslims? Well, are you explain in the same way. The same way, because they don't realize this, because uh, their iman, their faith is different from our faith. 
But the same way, if you explain to them in Islam, even though we see it as being tragedies, we see it as being disasters, there actually could be a lot of good in it. When September 11th happened, that was an evil thing. But also, uh, there may have been some good for the, some of the Muslims, how many people became Muslim when they read about it. It made a lot of people hate Islam on the other aspect. So it was, it was actually a more evil in it, obviously. But any type of tragedy, any type of thing, you explain to them the Muslim outlook. And unfortunately, a lot of the non-Muslims, they do not know these things that we know. So it's our job to show them. And that's why now, uh, when you go to the West, you look at the suicide rate in the West. And they have all the things from the dunya, as the brother mentioned, that we're not as advanced as Muslim countries. They have all, all this advanced technology and sciences and what have you, but you'll find that they kill themselves all the time because they don't know why they're here. What is their goal in life? But we as Muslims, we know, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah has not created us except for His worship. And we know that we're here to be tested. They don't realize this, so the only way He finds a way out of what He's in is to commit suicide. So you explain to them the same way you, that we explain now. There's actually, this reminds us of why we're here in the dunya is to worship Allah as one and to do as much as we can from good deeds and stay away from that which is displeasing to Allah and Allahu A'lam. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Sharmin Rahman Khan. I've come from Bangladesh. I'm a homemaker. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and to listen to all your wonderful lectures. I had a question, uh, like if there is a disaster in a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, uh, as we know that we are supposed to do dua for only Muslims, so if there is a disaster in a Muslim country, what should we do in another country? What kind of dua we should do for them? The dua that's not allowed for non-Muslims and after they die, we know this. But during the death, they need to make one, I'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for them. Allah I don't see a problem with this. And also, I need to help them out. And at the end of the day, even if they're not Muslims, they're human beings. And that's why uh, I recall a lot of our brothers in America, when there was a, the major hurricane in Florida, they went and they helped out and they helped rebuild the houses and they helped feed and clothe people who had lost all their things during the hurricane. So uh, there's no problem with this. And because at the end, they are, uh, you know, our brother in, in humanity. So it's not just because they say well, they're non-Muslim, we're not going to help them. No, we help them out as well. And we do what we can for them. And even though our Muslim brother has more rights on us, at the same time, we can help out anybody, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, in Allah Alam. And it's something evil like that. We don't, want, we don't wish anything would happen. We don't want anybody to be killed by a tsunami or by this. And even the non-Muslims. We want the good for them. And we want them to experience what we experience from the beauty and from the halal, the sweetness of Iman. And we want them, inshallah, to be able to benefit from that. And they want them to die on the correct religion as well, just as we hope we die on the correct religion. And Allah Alam. Thank you. Jazakallah. The next question from the front mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Talat Ansari. My question is, is the disaster due to human bad work or bad deeds was disaster there in the age of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahabas? As it came in the verse, Bima kisabat aidihim, that it's from what they have done. It can be a punishment from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It can also be sometimes it could be a test from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Any major disasters, you mean like natural disasters during the time of the Prophet uh, I, I don't recall. I, got, Allah, I, can, I can't recall. If there... Because in disaster, everyone is killed. Innocent or the bad one. Say, that's true. But it came in the, in the Sunnah that Prophet ﷺ mentioned to Aisha anha, that at the end of time, a Jaish, an army, will come to the Kaaba. And, and they mentioned that all the people will be taken, they will be killed. And they said, Aisha, she was concerned about this. She said, you know, they have the people in their aswaq, in their marketplaces, and they're innocent people. And he said at the end of the hadith, the meaning of which is uh, that they will be sent uh, forth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ala They will be sent on their intentions. And if they were good, they will be judged accordingly, even if they were punished with the people who were being punished. So if somebody can be punished at the same time, he can be an innocent person, he can be a good person, he can be a pious person. And he dies with the people who are being punished, but he will be sent forth on that with Niyyah, the intention he had, and on the Iman he had, and he will not be uh, in the same punishment of the evil people who are punished by that disaster. In Allahu Alam. Thank you. The next question from the Ria Mike. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Khokar. I'm a consultant. 
I am still not clear on the concept of Qadr, destiny. Uh, in the Quran it is mentioned that uh, whatever good you get is because of your good deeds and whatever you bad you get is because of the doings of your hand. So where does the concept of Qadr come into picture? Because if you are doing good, you get good. If you are doing bad, you get bad. The other thing is, if you talk about the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, people who die, they have been destined to die at a particular time and in a particular way. But what about the people who are bombing? Are they also destined to bomb them? Then if that is there, then they are not accountable. Can you please give me some clarity on this? I don't understand what you want from the second part of the question. The second part is, if you talk about the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, there are people who are dying because of the bombing. Now, if they are dying, they are dying because they have been destined to die at a particular time and in a particular way. But what about the people who are throwing the bombs? If that is also destined, then they are not accountable for that. Can you give me clarity on this, please? In, in, in Qadr, as you mentioned, the good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then, but in, and in general, whatever happens, the kulu shay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khalaq bi Qadr. Everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created with Qadr in your destiny. So everything that happens to you, it's from the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's good or, for, or whether it's bad. So it's not all the time like you mentioned. It could be uh, the good and bad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's in the Qadr. It's going to happen to you. And it could happen for different reasons. Even if you are doing good, and how many people we know who are good and pious, they get cancer, for example. That's not a good thing. It's a terrible thing. And they die from that cancer. But perhaps this could actually be a blessing in disguise, even as I mentioned in the beginning. It seems it's something evil. But this person will have his sins forgiven uh, through that terrible sickness and what have you. So all of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the second thing, and other people, they're held accountable. Everybody who kills an innocent person is held accountable. It doesn't mean because Allah knows that these people are going to die at a certain time in a certain way, that you're not going to be held accountable. And you, you'll be held accountable. Even that's why in Islamic law, if you kill an innocent person, then you are executed through qisas, that you will be executed as well. So you will be held accountable in this dunya, and also you'll be held accountable in the, in the akhirah and the hereafter as well. In Allahu Alam. Uh, can I, is the person who is killing another person, is he also destined to perform that act? Allah knows what's going to happen. He chose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't forget, when it comes to qadr, we are not any like robots. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the will to choose which path we're going to take. He showed us the path of good and he showed us the path of evil. And we choose which one we're going to take. Some of us take the path of good. Some of us take the evil, some of us crisscross between the two. Uh, and then we are held accountable for all of this on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us the will to choose what we're going to do. But in His Qadr, He knew which one we are going to choose. Allah knows everything that this happened from the time He created the heavens and earth until uh, the end of time. He knows everything that will happen. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows it now. So He has given us the will to choose. And then after that, we will be held accountable for which way we choose uh, on the Day of Judgment. Thank you.